Isabel Yoy Sasakwala and Ellie Wiesel founded Forum 2000 for a purpose. The world is upside down. How should we put it back together? Are we able to act responsibly? Can we work together, play by the rules, and restore solidarity? Let's use this crisis as an opportunity. A new world emerging? Watch the online Forum 2000 conference, October 12th to 14th. Hello. We can we can start. We have a fantastic panel for you here, and we also have an interesting topic at our Forum 2000 panel. But let me first thank the organizers, uh, Jakub, Dominika, Martin, David, many other people who spent many years and now many months organizing this year, a very unusual Forum 2000. We were very young when they started, now we're gradually becoming middle-aged. And now we have to take over some of the things uh, and some of the ideas that they have produced over the years. Uh, we are, I think, a proof of their perseverance, but also proof that we will never surrender. We've, under these difficult circumstances, uh, we'll have this uh, conference and we'll have this panel that will focus on something that is not specifically this year issue. This year's issue is COVID, but in many ways this year's <laughs> issue has shown how important it is. We will focus on... Uh, different forms, let's say, of populism. Uh, the title of our forum is Politics of Fear, Politics of Hate, Facing the Growing Intolerance in Democratic Societies. And what we will try to explore in this forum is the reasons for obnoxious populism gaining so much support across the world. Populism that hates knowledge, that despise, despises exp uh, expertise, despises facts, despises truth, uh, dis dislikes uh, responsibility, dislikes accountability, dis dislikes civility, political equality, all of these things. So uh, we will try to find out how we can understand it better in order to face it and fight it. The panelists are Sabine Lighthouser Schnarrenberger, I hope I said that right, a yes. lawyer. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Sabine. A lawyer, deputy chairwoman of the liberal Friedrich Naumann Stiftung or foundation, <clears throat> one of the three big German foundations promoting democracy around the world. Uh, she was twice German Minister of Justice for 23 years, had been a member of uh, German pa uh, Parliament as Bundestag, and has written two books of which I especially like the one with the title Fear It Eats Up Freedom that she published last year. 
Uh, we also have David Harris. He is the CEO of American Jewish Committee. For 14 years, David had a weekly program on CBS Radio Network. And one of the great things that was said about him was former President Shimon Peres of Israel, foreign minister of the Jewish people. That's how he called David Harris. We have Iman Gilmore, EU Special Representative for Human Rights, but also former Tonishte, Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Ireland, and the Foreign Minister and Minister of Trade of Ireland. David uh, uh, Iman wrote two books, but one uh, about the crisis, especially pertinent for today, is Inside the Room on the crisis of the Irish government. Also has a number of different titles, but let's stay with, with uh, these few. Finally, Erika Guevara Rosas, America's director of Amnesty International, human rights lawyer from Universidad de Londres in Mexico City, feminist activist, I salute you here, uh, former legal and security officer for High Commissioner for Refugees of the U United Nations. Uh, I will start with sort of a question for, Sab for uh, uh, Sabine, since she is leading an organization that actually goes around the world and tries to teach people how to do good politics, how <laughs> to mobilize people to fight for human rights, fight for rule of law, fight for equality. Under the circumstances that this is considered completely boring. I've heard a number of uh, people saying, your liberal ideas or your ideas of human rights, this is really boring. These guys are punk, these guys that <laughs> attack uh, conventional wisdom. So under these circumstances, where a lot of even young people think that, I don't know, politics is more like entertainment. Uh, you see these guys fight in a ring, say obnoxious and impolite things to each other, that this is what can mobilize them. How do you, under these circumstances, actually mobilize people to still care for the values that Friedrich Naumann Stiftung and I would say all of us here stand for? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much for uh, your question and thank you so much to join uh, this uh, panel today. Liberal ideas are inspiring and not boring. Uh, look at Belarus, look at uh, Hong Kong, also look at uh, Navalny. It's dangerous to fight for liberal ideas, but uh, liberal ideas are not boring. That's uh, my first comment. Um, second, yes, we are as uh, Friedrich Naumann Foundation um, are working globally, uh, also in uh, some Euro European member states like Poland and Hungary, and uh, we are focused on um, minorities of the rights of the minorities, and this is very important, uh, for example, in uh, Poland and Hungary, and one, our, one of our focuses are sexual minorities. Yes, what are we doing there? First, we try to explain or try to discuss uh, causes for uh, the political um, atmosphere who, and we are facing uh, this um, uh, atmosphere um, uh, ignoring tolerance, um, working with uh, fakes and with hatred speeches, speeches. So causes are, in our opinion, of our view, first, the complicity of politics in a global uh, world. That's the first point. Second is 
people uh, don't feel recognized. They accuse um, the so-called elite um, ignoring uh, their interests. So first we discuss, uh, and there are other reasons, sure. Um, first we are um, putting these um, topics um, uh, on the table. Then we have a lot of instruments, measures uh, to deal with. Um, we are supporting liberal part, um, liberal politicians in these um, various um, uh, states, and um, we are trying to give them uh, or trying to improve their skills to act. That um, that means networking, 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 also with the youth organization. Uh, that um, means a lot of workshops. That um, means um, to um, uh, improve their skills, to act as a party, to um, promote the infrastructure uh, for uh, dealing with all these um, very complex, Yes, very different um, issues and aspects. And uh, sure, we try to have uh, live ses sessions, but we are now um, we have now enhanced um, on digital on our digital skills. So my impression is, I'm not. Um, my impression is that there is a, um, op a great openness. Um, in this part of the societies of uh, these states um, uh, to uh, listen to these uh, universal human uh, values. But yes, you have, you need a language people can understand, not political speech. When you have always the, the, the same words without here. saying something. Okay. Thank okay. you very, thank you very much. I, I, I apologize okay. for interrupting you people, but this yes, is, it's okay. This it's is okay. One of my okay. David, uh, this was way more optimistic than actually I expected <laughs> because it <laughs> sometimes seems very difficult to fight for the right thing. Um, so one of the aspects of, of uh, the surge of populism uh, even of movements such as, for instance, QAnon and you know, these mm -hmm. uh, global global conspiracy movements. One of their aspects is using anti-Semitism. And I would say that fighting anti-Semitism is uh, one of the generic forms of fighting for uh, human rights. You have been at it for a long time. Did you need to change your strategy? Did you need to change your approach? So first of all, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be part of Forum 2000 and to um, remember the extraordinary legacy of someone I admired and knew a bit, Václav Havel. Uh, so yes, I would completely agree with the premise. Um, Anti-Semitism becomes a litmus test uh, by the way, in good times and in bad, of a society's actual commitment to universal human rights and to liberal democratic values. We have seen in recent years um, a surge in anti-Semitism. It began um, in Western Europe uh, in the early 2000s. It spread um, across Europe. Uh, it ca came across the Atlantic Ocean. We have seen it here in the United States as well um, in more recent years. Uh, there are various ways of trying to explain it, uh, one of which I think is the collapse of the center in, in many democratic societies, mm -hmm. uh, which has only fueled or empowered people on the extremes. Uh, a second, of course, and it's a topic uh, in and of itself, um, is the um, accelerant of social media uh, as, a, as, as a propellant, if you will, of conspiracy theories of, um, of hatred, uh, of anti-Semitism. A third is the fading of memory. I mean, one has to be in the 80s or 90s today to have any recollection whatsoever of the Nazi and fascist era. One has to be in the 40s or 50s to have any recollection of the communist era on the European continent. And since history itself is largely neglected today, uh, it's very hard to to teach. We have recent surveys that show uh, an abysmal knowledge, for example, of the Holocaust 
today in Europe and in the United States. So when we speak about the intersection of liberal democracy and anti-Semitism, uh, we have to talk about uh, education, 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 and not just as a kind of uh, generic word, but how can we effectively teach liberal democratic values, civic values in the 21st century to increasingly pluralistic societies? And, and how can we teach about the threat of anti-Semitism, not just to Jews, but to liberal societies uh, against the backdrop of the Holocaust, which again, for many is ancient history. So I think the challenges are considerable uh, and the solutions uh, may be obvious, but they're not easy. Thank, thank you very much. Ian, this, you, you've, you were tasked by the European Union to deal with human rights at a time when I think there is an extreme need for addressing this issue, but at the same time when this has somehow gone out of fashion. And we remember uh, Fukuyama's end of history when we thought that you know, the time of human rights has arrived. And now all of a sudden uh, you see huge masses of people supporting and, and demonstrating in favor of reducing human rights of different groups. They could be ethnic groups, they could be gays, they could be people who just think differently. How do you address that uh, in times when, when you know, politics is almost more of an entertainment than serious business? Well, I think a couple of things. First of all, I think we have to remember that um, uh, democracy is still very much in its infancy. It has yet to reach uh, full maturity. It's still very vulnerable. Um, and uh, recall, in fact, that in Europe, there are very few uh, European states that have been a continuous democracy for the past 100 years. Secondly, uh, the, the populism that we're addressing is not a new phenomenon. We, again, this was something that we saw with devastating consequences in Europe in the, in the 20th century. What I think is new is that the conditions uh, for the growth of populism are probably more favourable now than they have been for some time. And I think there are two things that are contributing to that. The first is what I would call the pace of change. Uh, Thomas Friedman describes it in his book, The Age of Accelerations, where the change is now so rapid that uh, people are finding it very difficult to keep pace with it. We're seeing in economically the globalized phenomenon of globalization, what that has done to job security, what it has done to economic security, to what we used to call uh, the social contract, uh, the levels of... Um, precariousness that particularly young people uh, are experiencing uh, uh, today. And then that all of that is overlaid with the uncertainties around climate change, technological change, and now, of course, more recently, the pandemic. So in a way, you have this perfect storm uh, of uncertainty, uh, which means that uh, the ground for the growth of fascism or for populism is more fertile now <laughs> than it has been for a long time. Promoting, uh, uh, promoting the, the politics of fear uh, and, and so on. And I think that for, for that reason, um, I think when we talk about human rights, I think we have to talk about more than civil and political rights. I think we have to talk also much more than we used to about social, economic and cultural rights. And certainly in the work that the European Union is doing uh, on human rights, we're putting a greater emphasis on that these days. The second big phenomenon, I think, is that uh, populism has found its medium, uh, social media. Uh, I spent 30 years in the parliament of my country in active elected politics. The way in which we communicate politics has changed phenomenally in that 30 year period. Now you have a situation where you have a deluge of information and even to get your even to get your even to get attention for your message there's almost need to say something outrageous or very dramatic uh, and the the medium for the communication of politics now lends itself more easily to those who want to communicate simple messages uh, who want to target minorities 
who want to say that all problems are have simple have simple solutions. Communicating more complex messages is more difficult uh, in the present environment, and therefore I think that what we also need to do is we need to look at new ways uh, of deliberation. Uh, how do how do we how, how are ideas exchanged? I mean, everybody lives in this kind of echo chamber of your own bubble in the in, in social media. So how, how does debate uh, take place? And I think that we have to look at new ways of innovating politics so that we can have greater deliberation, greater debate and a livelier and healthier uh, democracy. Thank you so much. That leads in directly to the question that I have for Erica. Um, I think you, I'm sure you've seen, but a lot of people have seen the movie or the, the television program, Mrs. America, uh, about Phyllis Schlafly, a uh, 60s um, activist against the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment in the United, in the United States. In other words, an anti-feminist. And it's amazing how they illustrate the way she lies, the way she lies in her public addresses, in her, and how she justifies that. And it shows that lying has been around uh, for a long time and used in, in politics. And somehow it has been quite effective in mass mobilization. But it seems that it has changed its nature. It's not new, as, as Iman has said, none of these things are really new, but in a way they have taken a new, new life, a new form. And now it's almost considered a, a skill. So under these uh, circumstances, how do you see the um, effective ways of political mobilization? When you have to fight both lying and constant creating of rage and outrage. People are constantly have to be outraged and they go for it. And at the same time, you have to, to mobilize them for you know, something that, let's say, is more humane, like women's rights, like human rights, like you know, something that, that has to do with compassion, empathy, and and a positive attitude rather than with hatred and rage. Uh, but this is a, the big question to answer, right? I mean, uh, it is in this very complex moment where the politics of hate, the politics of division, the politics of demonization, right? Demonizing the other, the, uh, blaming groups of population about the challenges and the issues that the majority of people are facing. It is extremely difficult in, in a time where, as you were saying, uh, authoritarian leaders are lying, right? Constantly are using the media um, uh, in an intentional way, meaning that it's not just that the media is out there uh, you know, getting these messages out. I mean, it is intentional also that the media is perpetuating these conditions where the others, the othering of people, are playing an important role in the politics of demonization, of division and hate. But I think that one important point uh, about mobilizing people is about understanding the, the conditions and the context. And I think that we've been talking about this uh, uh, with my peer panelists, right? I mean, it is not just about ignorance or it's not just about people to vote against their own interests. It is about understanding the conditions that these politicians, that these authoritarian leaders are creating uh, to build on the politics of demonization and the politics of fear, that it's the most important piece, right? I mean, we've seen, uh, particularly in Latin America, for instance, of the last few years, how uh, the discontent of people, the, the, the dis disenfranchisement of people have been utilized by these strong men that are showing uh, or trying to demonstrate very simple uh, solutions to extremely complex problems. And at the end of the day, people's lives are not changing by these, these uh, policies, right? So, but I, I think that it is important to understand this context because it's then how we can start fighting these 
politics of demonization by using the politics of compassion, the politics of solidarity, the politics of empathy, as you were mentioning, right? But these conditions are, are very clear. It's not just people want to vote for these, for these authoritarian leaders or the growing appeal of these authoritarian leaders is, is natural only because people are being attracted. I mean, people are being attracted because they are conditions that are enabling this to happen. On the one hand, for instance, the attacks on, on human rights, and particularly at, attacks against human rights defenders, those who have the courage to confront these authoritarian leaders by telling the truth, by defending the rights of others, by defending the environment, by defending the territory against economic interest, because behind all these politics, uh, there is also a strong economic interest by the few that want to continue to control the resources of the majority, right? And then uh, having these attacks against human rights defenders is having um, a, a, a very negative impact on people's, on people's minds and on societies and how we are organizing, right? I mean, the killings of human rights defenders in Latin America as, as the most dangerous region of the world to defend rights is increasingly becoming a uh, normalizing society, right? It's part of the common to see that human rights defenders have been killed and nothing is happening, right? Impunity continues to be the norm. So when people are trying to demand the rights, they have the fear and the of the consequences of demanding this right, right? And also the media, as uh, all my peers have been mentioning, uh, that is not just the use of social media and the hate that is being, you know, propagating social media. It's also that social media has been intentionally created to open a space for these messages, right? They are logarithms, we see violence against women in social media with open impunity because nothing happens. There is no consequences against that. So if we don't tackle that, if we don't address the, the conditions and the causes, then it's going to be very difficult to mobilize people on these politics of solidarity and empathy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have to now open our panel for for questions, but we'll see how that goes. And because I have a number of other questions that I would like us to address, but let's see first whether there are some questions for us uh, from the public. I don't see them. I don't see them. Uh, at the moment, let's see. Great. Let's let's continue uh, continue our uh, dis discussion. Uh, what Erica said is this uh, strategy of destruction of not destruction, but the the um, sort of. Channel, channeling uh, the um, to distract people, in other words, channeling the attention, public attention, from the key issues that are bothering them, like, for instance, poverty, like, for instance, disenfranchisement, like, for instance, being marginalized, uh, and using different kinds of identity politics to sort of distract them from focusing on what makes them really frustrating. Uh, for instance, uh, there, are, there are a number of, of uh, issues regarding economic differences and poverty that are not being addressed. But at the same time, there are issues such as, for instance, uh, vaccination and fighting against uh, the uh, you know, using the vaccines uh, in order to and that creates a lot of passionate discussion. Uh, is this? Let me go. Let me go back to to uh, Sabina. Uh, is this something that you encounter in your work? This this uh, sort of substituting uh, issues that people care about and are angry about with something that is marginal but can uh, attract people's attention, like, for instance, vaccines. 
Um, yes, um, this is part of our program and of uh, uh, our um, discussions. And um, um, we, uh, regarding the pandemic in Germany and the uh, politics um, dealing with this uh, pandemic, we uh, consider that there is a increasing part of the population of people who are demonstrating against these politics. And we are not um, fighting against the politics, but we are uh, explaining and we are discussing and reflecting um, the uh, different approaches. And we are uh, on the one on the one side, there is on the one hand there is um, um, restrictions of freedoms. People are um, uh, demonstrating against it. On the other hand, we need to protect. Um, the um, the health of the people and of the older one and of um, the other parts of uh, our population. Yes, and there we have an empathic uh, discussion among a lot of people. And I think we ha we have the chance to explain, to raise awareness for these problems. And um, I think if the people have uh, the possibility to take part in these discussions, then it is a first step to mobilize them for um, our values and for democracy. But we need transparency, we need platforms for discussion, and then I think we can Yes, yes, we, we can um, reach a part of these um, people who are open for a right uh, or left uh, populist uh, um, uh, discussions and ideas. Mm -hmm. Iman, uh, one of the questions that was, that was asked by uh, the people... Uh, or voters, let's say, more susceptible to lies than to truth? Um, I, I, I don't know. Can you hear me, um, Dasna? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yes, yes, yes because I, mm -hmm. I, I lost you, but I see the, um, uh, I see the question uh, on, on, the, uh, mm -hmm. on, on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes, I, I, I think what, I, I think all of us are susceptible to, um, is to uh, is to hear what we want to hear and to hear uh, good news and to hear that there is uh, a solution. And if somebody comes along and says there is that is a simple problem and there is a simple solution to it, and that simple solution may be uh, let's let's deal with the migrants. It's it's their fault, or uh, let's deal with somebody or somebody else's fault, and we can we can uh, we can deal with it that that way. Of course, people are are susceptible uh, to that. And I think that the, the challenge for us in addressing it is not just to address the politics of populism. What we have to also address is the causes of populism. And the reality is that there are very significant causes. There are very significant economic, social issues, range of issues in, our, in, in all of our societies, which makes the populist message uh, attractive. And therefore, we also have to uh, we, we also have to deal with that. I think also I think we have to deal with the medium. And uh, again, the the European Union has been, uh, I think, providing some leadership on this. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen has uh, talked about the uh, the digital um, uh, agenda and the idea of a community of of values. Uh, we've taken a number of initiatives. The uh, code of conduct that we worked out with uh, the big IT platforms. Uh, we've also. Uh, been um, working on um, an, a number of um, uh, directives, the um, racial equality directive, the gender equality directive, we have coordinators on uh, anti-Semitism, um, on anti-Muslim hatred. Soon there will be a coordinator on uh, anti-racism. Uh, anti uh, the new action plan on human rights and democracy that is now being uh, concluded will have a major provision uh, one of these big priority areas will be uh, on technology and uh, how, n not just how the, the hate speech can be controlled on uh, and how it can be lessened uh, on social media and, and new, new communication technologies, but uh, also how these technologies can be harnessed and used for good. How, for example, um, 
uh, to uh, follow up the point that Erica made, how, for example, uh, new technology can be used as a means of providing greater protection for human rights defenders. Uh, the human rights defenders, many of them who are being killed and attacked in uh, South America, for example, are people who are living and working in very remote areas and where the potential for the use of new technology as a means of providing greater protection, I think, has, has enormous so. potential. So we, we, we have to work at these, at these solutions. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I want to bring back the issue. There is another another question that you will see on your screens, uh, the uh, how to decrease the influence of the Russian Federation in creating fear and hate, disinformation, lowering civil liberties, uh, etc. I will go back to this question in a minute. But I just want to raise another one. And this is re uh, related to civil society. We always think of civil society as something good, positive. Today, you have civil society movements that are fighting to reduce rights of different groups, to eliminate different groups from the public sphere. David, maybe you can address that, that issue because anti-Semitism was sometimes also a grassroots movement, not only, you know, uh, propagated by by murderous elites, but also sometimes quite. And I think it's important to address this aspect of civil society that's maybe not so nice. So um, maybe anticipating this conversation in 2020, um, 20 years ago, I led a graduate seminar at Johns Hopkins University, um, which focused on strategies for dealing with hate. Uh, which was then re-emerging on the European continent. And together with the graduate students in the class, we developed um, a set of strategies and a prioritization for the strategies. And it's interesting for me to, to look back on that work 20 years ago by the students in the class and apply it today. At the very top of the list, they said, and I would repeat um, as my own view as well, is the central role of political leadership, of responsible, democratic political leadership. And I would, I would say as a, um, if you will, as a provocative proposition, uh, Vyasna, that I think that uh, in many parts of the democratic world, uh, we are missing um, the, the kind of uh, leadership, courageous, bold leadership that's needed at a time like this. Uh, number two, uh, my students said, where is civil society? What role is civil society playing? And then they broke down civil society as we must because there is, there, there is no such thing per se, uh, though it's the intermediate force or the, the mediating force between government and people. Religious leadership. Uh, are religious leaders standing up and speaking out and playing a responsible role in trying to strengthen liberal democracy and the glue that holds our societies together? Or are they playing an irresponsible role and fueling the centrifugal forces that are pulling us apart? Uh, the media, it's come up before. Uh, then the focus was a bit more on traditional media than on social media. But what role is the media playing? Um, education, what role is education playing? So I, I think that at a time like this, uh, and I, I want to underscore what Eamon said um, in his opening remark. We need to remind ourselves of the brevity and the fragility of liberal democracy as we know it, certainly in the West. Uh, in the span of recorded history, liberal democracy is a blip on the screen. And those who assume that because it's here now, it will be here forever, I think have little to no understanding of history uh, and what can undo it. So, yes, I believe that, uh, if you will, the, the politics of centrism in a democratic society, which may not sound particularly glamorous, is, is, is however, the necessary politics, which was, again, strong, bold, courageous, visionary leaders, those who don't follow, those who lead, uh, and a civil society which begins to mobilize far more seriously against the extremes. Because absent, absent Agree. that centrist voice, the extremes will continue to move forward. 
I, I agree. Our, our task is also to somehow find ways in which we can make exactly the values that you have mentioned, we can make them attractive. We can make them actually you know, get people out of their homes and, and uh, act on the slides. Who would like to take this question that, uh, that has appeared now on the screen? Let me just see it. Uh, regarding the the uh, uh, role of the Russian Federation or Russia in uh, fear, hate, disinformation. In other words, I would let's say uh, reformulate this this question. It is so easy to influence uh, elections, uh, social movements by uh, creating fear, cheating, lying. Uh, how do you confront that? Maybe Erica, but I also have another question for you specifically for Latin America. But how do you confront uh, representing such a big organization as Amnesty International? How do you confront and, and deal with this enormous amount of, of uh, organized, let's say, production industry of outrage and lies? I mean, we've, we've talked about the politics of demonization, the politics of division. These are not new, right, but are taking different forms precisely because the context is quite adverse for people's rights, particularly economic, social and cultural rights, as it's been mentioned. And it is connected, of course, interconnected to, to the freedom of expression and the rights, the civil and political rights. And, and with the risk to call the pandemic an opportunity, because, of course, the tra tragedy that is evolving is very difficult to see how a pandemic can be an opportunity. But the reality is that the COVID-19 crisis presents important opportunities where choices can be made. For those who embrace the politics of demonization, it's an opportunity to continue to divide, polarize, othering, you know, marginalize communities, blaming them and gaining more power. For human rights movement, it is a moment to project a vision of a more equitable, sustainable and just world. And it is important that we take the moment to present the solutions. I mean, Amnesty International has been denouncing and documenting human rights violations for 60 years. We have a lot of experience doing that. But we to demonstrate the alliances and, of course, accompanying other human rights movements on the ground, that we can also present also present solutions. So we have to take, we have to win the battle of ideas, right? We have to take a communication first approach where we are speaking to people's realities. We are taking issues that widely, right? That resonate with a woman who is thinking about how she is going to feed her family in a context where the pandemic is controlling it, right? We need to speak to those youth who are taking to the streets, rec reclaiming a space for the climate justice fight, right? We need to bring those emerging movements into the center of all what we do. It's not just about the legal and the moral battle, because it's not enough, because these authoritarian leaders are lying to these people as well. It is important that we take this communication first approach so that we can speak to the hearts of people and we can embrace the emerging movements that are being created because of the context and the reality, but sometimes they are not finding platforms in our own communities, in our organizations, because we are so fixed into documenting what these authoritarian leaders are doing rather than presenting an opportunity for these movements to really push for their solutions and their alternatives. So it is important that we also look at ourselves, you know, all the lessons learned, that are hard, but also all the failures in how we are enabling the these leaders to, to grow in appeal to the communities and the societies. This is something that I always thought we, we would uh, use the experience of Latin America because a decade ago it was a continent where you know in every country you had more or less a very nice most uh, in a lot of cases a woman president who was pushing democracy. And how these um, trends were reversed, how you can go backwards. This, I think, has been shown uh, now, not only in Latin America, but globally. It may, might have started there, but now we see it globally. And actually what we are dealing with at the moment is trying to 
sort of keep our fingers in the dam, so to speak, to, to, to begin with, stop the world from going backwards and then find ways, because all of this, as all of you said, all of this has been known before, but it has come to the forefront. This hate, this targeting minorities, this uh, uh, you know, fighting people and setting people against each other, uh, this parochialism, this anti-feminism, all of this has been be here before, but we thought we were out of the woods. It seems we are not yet. And thank you so much for your contribution. I was asked by the organizers to sort of uh, uh, take two or three points out of our panel that, that uh, we would recommend to, to, for people to remember. And my three points would be from what you have said, A, the concept of rights has to be broadened. It's not the political rights in the classical liberal theory uh, sense. It has to start dealing with also everyday life experience. It has to include economic rights and, and all the others if we want to be relevant. Second, social media. We have to learn how to use it effectively for good instead of just treating it as a menace and again addressing real people's realities through uh, social media and final point central role of the political leadership this is really what i think to a great extent we lack at the moment all around the world political leadership and education i will not name the leader, but one leader at one point said, I hate the, I, I love the poorly educated. Not I will provide them with education, I will give your ch children a better chance. We have to provide better education for people if we are to face populism effectively. Thank you very, very much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you.